president of the Washington Cap Society. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to, I could say, this evening's program, I could say today's program, or I could say tomorrow morning's program. <laughs> in any case, the subject is Key West. So if we can't actually be in Margaritaville, at least Rodney <laughs> Kite Powell will give us a good look. As in uh, previous Zoom programs, this one is sponsored by a partnership of seven MAP societies representing all parts of the US, the California, Chicago, New York, Philip Lee Phillips, Rocky Mountain, Texas, and uh, our own Washington MAP Society. All of these societies are nonprofit organizations that support map collecting, cartography, and the study of cartographic history. And if you're not a member, we hope you will consider joining at least one MAP Society. Um, the benefits for each, all the, each society are different. I'm going to do our plug now. Members of the Washington Map Society receive three annual issues of our journal, The Portalon, as well as digital access to all past issues of The Portalon, digital access to past guest speaker lectures, and many other features in the members only section of the website, including a directory of members. And if you're not a member, we have an introductory rate of $25 for the first year of digital membership. Now, we and our partner MAP societies would like to thank our advertisers who support our groups and also help make possible the publication of our journals. The Portalon, as I mentioned, and Calafia, the Journal of the California MAP Society. Now, before we get into the meet, uh, there are a couple of requests. Please note that the lecture is being recorded. So please turn off your video and microphone if you do not want to be recorded and please use the chat feature to type questions and then be addressed at the conclusion of the talk. And now let me turn the program over to Ron Grimm, the Washington Map Society Vice President and Program Chair. Ron? Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, in with consultation with the other MAP societies, uh, we are in the process of developing a schedule of monthly Zoom and in-person meetings for the 2023-24 fall and winter season. Uh, we will have no meetings during July and August. The next meeting, the next Zoom meeting is scheduled for Tuesday evening, September 14, starting at seven o'clock p.m. Eastern time. The speaker will be Richard Franklin-Viglia, Professor Emeritus of the University of Texas at Arlington, and currently Associated Scholar, Willamette University, Salem, Oregon. Uh, the talk of his title is going to, or the th uh, uh, theme of his talk is going to be a little bit different. He's looking at the role of maps in films about exploration and discovery using some Latin America examples. And a little fuller account of this is published in this issue of the Portal in, which I just received today. So if you haven't received yours yet, it should be coming soon. And now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Rodney Kite Powell, the director of the Touched and Map Center in, at the Tampa Bay History Center. In his presentation, he will tell us about a map exhibition currently on display at the Tampa Bay History Center. And this exhibit and his talk are entitled Key West and the Florida Keys, Mapping the History of the Conch Republic. Rodney will address a few of your questions at the conclusion of his presentation. Uh, you may type questions in the chat feature either during the talk or at the end. And now I turn the program over to Rodney. Thank you so much, Ron. And uh, looking at that picture, uh, I think I need a new picture for my profile. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, that was pre-COVID, as you can imagine. Um, I started growing this beard and, and with COVID, and my daughter won't let me shave it. So um, I joke about taking it off a lot. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here. And 
you know, there is the reference to Margaritaville. I, I wish that I could have um, had, you know, Uber deliver a bottle of tequila and some margarita mix to all of you, but um, didn't work out. But hopefully you guys will enjoy at least this little piece of Margaritaville and the history of, of uh, the Florida Keys and Key West through the map collection. So I know, you know, probably most, if not all of you, know uh, Tom Touchton, who is the not only the founder of the of the History Center, but also the um, contributor of about 90% or 80% of the maps in uh, our map collection, and of course, the namesake for the Touchton Map Library. Uh, he actually is in uh, London, probably just down the street from Philip, um, but uh, he chose a little earlier bedtime, which I totally understand, uh, mm -hmm. rather than attending this, but um, he does uh, send out his greetings to all of you. Uh, so, as Ron mentioned, we currently have on exhibit here at the the, uh, the map library an exhibit on, on Key West and the Florida Keys, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. The, uh, the, of course, we we uh, are going to focus on on maps and the recorded history of of the Keys and Key West, but I, I do want to touch on uh, the indigenous history, which is not uh, um, at least the pre-Columbian indigenous history, which is not recorded in maps. But unlike the Florida Peninsula where uh, people began living in what we know as Florida anywhere between 12 and 15,000 years ago. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the archeological evidence points to the um, human habitation of the Keys uh, to only about 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. And those people uh, became known as, as the Calusa uh, at the time of, of European contact in the early 1500s. And really they faced the same problems that um, the late Europeans and the Americans faced up until really the, the early 20th century <laughs> as far as access to reliable sources of fresh water uh, in, in the isolation that existed in the Keys. Uh, we are, we'll fast forward a bit to this map, which again, many of you are familiar with. This is the 1511 uh, Peter Martyr map of the Caribbean. And I will zoom in a bit. And you can see, of course, the center of the map is, is Cuba. And just to the north of Cuba, about 90 miles, as we know, it says it's upside down, but it says Island of Bimini, part of. And so, again, this is from 1511, published 1511, but it, and it predates the arrival of Juan Ponce de Leon to Florida, who was the, who's been credited um, as the discoverer, quote unquote, of Florida for, for a very long time. Uh, but it predates his, his arrival in Florida by two years. Not only that, Ponce de Leon was actually in search of the island of Bimini when he went on that 1513 expedition. So it's very likely that uh, Juan Ponce de Leon actually had access to or saw uh, this, this map or a copy of this, this map. Um, and so he was informed of, of what he was looking for. And also, of course, goes to, to, to point out that he was not the first European uh, to make landfall in Florida because it was known. And there's even stories of some of the indigenous people uh, understanding rudimentary Spanish when Ponce de Leon made landfall. So there undoubtedly were, were others who came through. Um, there's actually um, some, some story that, that, uh, that John Cabot encountered Florida in the Florida Keys uh, during his expedition in the 1490s, but that, that proof has, has yet been substantiated. But we certainly know by around 1511, uh, Florida and, and the Keys had been known uh, by Europeans, and thus the appearance on the map here. So it, it's in Herrera that we know a lot about the Juan Ponce de Leon expedition of 1513 and the subsequent expedition of 1521. And it's Herrera who says that Ponce de Leon named the Keys the, the Martyrs. And it's interesting, though, why Herrera says that uh, Ponce de Leon named the Keys the Martyrs. Uh, his explanation was, as you look at the Keys from the water, they look like a men who are kneeling about to be martyred. Uh, but it's, it's much more likely that if, if indeed Juan Ponce de Leon- can't hear him. You can't hear me? Can anybody else hear me? Hopefully everybody else can hear yeah, me. Yeah, we hear you. Oh, okay. Wait. Whoever couldn't hear you is- as a problem. Yeah, we, okay. we hear you very well. Right, okay. Hey, maybe just whoever said that, maybe your, your computer might be, uh, your speakers could be turned off. Of course, you can't hear me say that. Um, but um, 
But again, if, if, if it was Juan Ponce de Leon who did name the keys, the martyrs, it's very likely he named it after Peter Martyr, not after the shape of the islands. And I'll zoom in here. This is the 1601 Antonio Herrera map of the Caribbean that accompanied his, um, his history of the, of the Caribbean. And you can see just at the bottom of Florida, um, the point of the martyrs, the, uh, the, the point of those islands. Also, just as a Tampa note, the Bahia de Tampa um, indication there where Tampa Bay is, uh, is the first uh, time that the name Tampa appeared on a printed map. So a little bonus there with the Herrera map. So, no, 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 they just sent it ahead of time. No. Uh, so fast forwarding a bit again to this is the 1790s and the keys, the names, the name of the islands have changed over the years and particularly Key West finally got the name Cayo Hueso, which means bone key. And in this 1799 Spanish chart, you can see uh, if you look at the word Tortugas and you go to the east, the fourth name is C de Hueso, Cayo de Hueso or, or bone key. And the idea is Again, much like seeing the martyr-shaped islands, uh, some Spanish explorers encountered a number of bones on the islands, and they theorized that it was the aftermath of a very large battle among native groups. Um, and again, whether or not that's actually true is, is not known, but we do know from these maps that, uh, that Key West was known as Cayo Hueso. Now, the word uh, West in Spanish is Oeste, and it could be that the, the change from Cayo Hueso, Bone Island, to basically Cayo Oeste or Key West changed because of English speakers uh, not understanding Oeso versus Oeste, Bone versus West, and it is the, one of the largest westernmost islands in that chain. So it's among English speakers where the name Key West was, was solidified. And again, unknown exactly if it was just a misunderstanding of Spanish, not knowing that Hueso is, is Bone and again, Oeste is, is West, but Around this time, the early 1800s is when uh, the name Key West, the English name Key West, began to be used. So Florida, which has a very long history, as I've just kind of pointed out here, and Florida was a Spanish possession for most of its colonial times, from 1513 up until 1763, and then from 1763 to 1783 was English, and then from 1783 to 1821 was our second Spanish period. And it was during that time, the latter part of the second Spanish period, that a man named Juan Salas was granted the entire island of Key West by the then King of Spain. And that land grant um, survived the, the transition of ownership of Florida from Spain to the US. So in early 1821, when, when Florida became a US territory, or mid-1820, when Florida became a US territory, this Spanish man named Juan Salas owned the island. He didn't really know what to do with it. It wasn't deserted. It was inhabited by a few people, but it, it wasn't really anything that was great to own. And so he met a, name, a man named John Simonton, who was a uh, Alabama business from Mobile, and he sold the entire island of Key West for $2,000. That was in 1822. Simonton, in turn, sold three quarters of the land to other uh, landowners, and they began to, to develop the island. One of those was a man named William Whitehead, and uh, it was his, his brother, John Whitehead, who created the very first American plat uh, and map of, of the island of Key West and the town of Key West. The, the city, the, the town, and the island shared the same name. But for a brief time, when the U.S. Navy arrived in Key West in the late, 18, uh, late 1822, the naval commander decided to name the island Thompson's Island. Uh, after a man named Smith Thompson, who was the head of the Navy at the time, or the promotion board was at the Navy. And then uh, Port Rogers, also to curry favor with somebody else uh, within the Naval hierarchy. Uh, but neither one of those names really stuck and the name Key West did. Now this, this plat from 1829 uh, is a little bit more of a kind of a showing of an ambition rather than the reality at the time. Uh, Caroline Street, which is basically the uh, kind of upper left portion of the peninsula uh, to the north of that. Um, that was from Caroline to the north was about the only area that was actually platted. Everything south, even though it appears to be platted, uh, was still heavily wooded. And so uh, it took some time before the people of Key West began to actually push further south and sell those buildings. And then as you look at the island view, 
you'll see in the kind of central and eastern part of, of the island, there's a, a large tidal pond. And, um, and that was open to, to the, the currents of, of the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And it was the site of a lot of salt manufacturing. And uh, that lasted until 1846 when a hurricane swept through the island and closed off the inlets. And then eventually they, um, they filled in that, that, um, that pond to make it dry land. Now, this is a, one of my favorite pieces from the show. Uh, it's called The Pirate's Well. And it was by a man named George Lehman, who was an illustrator who worked with Audubon. John James Audubon actually came uh, to Key West in 1832, uh, looking for, for birds to, um, to, um, to paint. And so this was something that Lehman did during his time in Key West. Uh, and it points to a few different things that, that are, were important to Key West's history and the time in the 1830s. One, uh, there was a pirate history that related to, to the island. There was a lot of piracy in the Caribbean and in the southern part of Florida. And Key West was a natural location for, uh, for pirates to um, just to kind of lay low or to, to uh, you know, kind of rest and recuperate or do whatever they need to do. Um, but it's very close to the Gulf Stream, which was the main highway of the Spanish treasure fleet, leaving the, um, the New World and going back to Europe. So uh, Key West and the Florida Keys were kind of riddled with pirates. Um, but also the, the idea of the well. Again, I mentioned earlier with indigenous people, uh, a problem with sustaining a population on Key West and the Keys was the lack of reliable fresh water. There were these shallow wells, um, but they just could not sustain a large population. So as Key West grew, people began to really rely on cisterns that caught um, fresh rain rainwater, <clears throat> but even that was a limiting factor. So even though Key West became, for Florida standards, a pretty large city in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, it was still, its growth was still hampered in large part by the lack of reliable fresh water. <clears throat> and one last point, um, even though the, the map collection has uh, maps. Uh, there are a lot of early Florida or 19th century uh, Florida illustrations in the map collection or in the, in the overall collection. And so a lot of them are featured here, as is this one. Uh, a little out of the chronology, because <clears throat> this, this is a Harper's Weekly dated 1878, but it was really important to put at this part in the presentation, because um, as Key West began to grow in the 1830s, one of, and the Florida Keys in general began to grow in the 1830s. One of the main sources of income for people was the wrecking industry. And, and that was an industry where people would seek out shipwrecks and recover the um, items and the people on board. And because of the admiralty laws that existed, um, if they recovered these shipwrecks in the open waters, they would be the owners of those, of those materials. And so it was very profitable. So profitable, in fact, that Oftentimes, some of the less scrupulous wreckers would either um, remove shipping channel markers uh, so people would not be able to navigate, or they would erect erroneous shipping channel markers to guide ships into the many coral reefs that were in and around the Keys. Uh, one of the more notorious of these was a guy named John Houseman, who uh, had his operation in Indian Key, which is in the Middle Keys. And he became very, very wealthy, but he also was... <clears throat> um, not really welcome in Key West because of, of his, um, you know, his lack of morals, uh, because he was one of those who really caused a lot of these shipwrecks that he would then go out and re recover. Uh, Houseman <clears throat> was actually on Indian Key in the mid 1830s, early 1830s, when Indian Key was attacked by a group of Seminole Indians. During the 1830s, the US government was uh, looking to remove the Seminoles from Florida, and uh, they had already been pushed a bit to the south, uh, into the Everglades and further south. And uh, in retaliation for the attempts at removal, a group of Seminoles attacked Indian, uh, Indian Key and uh, burned many of the houses and, and actually killed several of the residents. Houseman escaped with his life, but uh, all of his possessions were, were burned uh, in that attack. <clears throat> Another really fantastic view of the island, this one from 1855 by a man named James Clapp. And this was when Key West was really beginning to hit its, its, its stride. Um, a, a lot of people were moving to the, to the city. It was gaining in population, gaining in importance. The wrecking industry was, was doing very well, as was fishing and sponging. 
a lot of Bahamians were moving into under the Keys as well. So you have native born Americans moving into to Key West, but you also have some Caribbean people moving to Key West in the Florida Keys. And you also have the beginnings of the cigar industry. Uh, the, the cigar industry was really well established in Cuba, particularly in Havana, um, but it already had made the jump across the Florida Straits by this time. Again, this, this scene was uh, created uh, nine years after that devastating 1846 hurricane. Uh, that was um, really a, a trying time for people on the Keys, but they, they did manage to recover rather quickly. And again, because the hurricane closed that inlet around the, that saltwater pond, they went ahead and decided to fill in that pond and add more land um, to, to add to the uh, prosperity of the Keys. Another huge economic factor of the Keys was the military spending. Uh, almost from the very beginning, uh, the US Navy had a presence on uh, Key West and within the Keys. And beginning in 1845 and, and going for about 10 years, uh, the US military constructed uh, this fort called Fort Taylor. And you can see from this illustration that the fort originally was, was off the coast of uh, Key West. And uh, I'm, my assumption is it was less expensive to build it off the coast, but to allow ships to be able to go right up next to it, than it would have been to dredge and fill in a harbor that would have had a deep enough draft for ships to, to go to the fort. Um, over time, uh, beginning in the late uh, um, 1800s and continuing through the early 1900s, there have been a lot of dredge and fill operations to enlarge Key West. And actually, now if you went to Fort Taylor, you would see it's entirely surrounded by land. You know, because we have a few maps at the end of this presentation that show that. Uh, again, another another favorite is the Bachman view. Uh, this is a really outstanding bird's eye view of Florida, uh, created by John Bachman at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, like in July or so. Um, the view is from July or so of 1861. Uh, the Gulf Blockading Squadron of the U.S. Navy has now surrounded, has already surrounded Florida. And the level of detail in Bachman's maps is just incredible. And with the Florida in particular, uh, because of the Seminole Wars, the wars to remove the Seminole Indians out of Florida, uh, it created so many forts throughout Florida. Uh, those forts are reflected on Bachman's map. And if you zoom in, which you can do, uh, if you go to our website and, and, and pull this map, you'll see that the forts all have flagpoles, but none of the flagpoles have flags on them because at this time, all of those forts are occupied by Confederate forces, except for two of them. Uh, one of them is the fort at Key West. Key West never fell into uh, Confederate hands, even though most of the citizens of Key West would have been pro-secession and many of them uh, were slaveholders. Um, but the, the naval presence there kept the island from falling into Confederate hands. And there's another fort in the Everglades that uh, was also uh, never in Confederate hands. Uh, and again, you can see from the, the, the scale of the blockade, uh, how difficult Florida was to patrol, um, but it was really important that Key West was held by the Navy. It also, throughout the course of the war, um, the Keys and particularly Key West uh, was the location for escaped enslaved African-Americans to flee to uh, where they could obtain their freedom, particularly uh, after 1863, after January 1863 and the, the um, enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. We have lots of charts in the collection and uh, wanted to include a chart that was created during the Civil War to show that um, the US government still had a vested interest in um, kind of constantly updating their charts throughout you know, Confederate held states, including Florida. And this one in particular also shows the extent of the, the, uh, the dry tortugas. And so, you know, oftentimes you think about Key West being the westernmost key in that string of islands that comes off of Florida, but it, it absolutely is not. Uh, Fort Jefferson is located a considerable distance to the west of Key West, very isolated, but it was a military post during the Civil War. It was actually a place where um, Dr. Mudd, uh, one of the people who's accused of uh, Lincoln's assassination and, and, and John Wilkes Booth's uh, hiding out, <clears throat> was actually imprisoned in Fort Jefferson for, for, for some time. And so again, it really shows the scale of the Gulf of Mexico and how far away things are and just how isolated 
the Keys were even Key West, but then when you look at how far how I said Fort Jefferson was even further to the west, it's really quite amazing. <clears throat> it's a wonder anybody was able to to um, to, to live out there and, and actually build a massive brick fortification in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Basically. Oh, David Brewster Ridges. That's really cool. Sad. So um, after the Civil War, uh, Key West began to really grow again. And one of the things that helped Key West's growth was another war. And that was uh, in 1868, the Cuban people started their first revolution against Spain to gain independence from Spain. It became known as the Ten Years' War. And at the, the onset of that war, uh, a lot of the cigar industry that was based in Havana moved north to Key West. And so that created a huge boom in Key West population. Uh, so much so that by 1880, uh, Key West was the largest city in Florida. Again, that's not saying too much. Uh, by being the largest city in Florida in 1880, uh, that meant that Key West had about a population of about 10,000 people. So Florida was very, very small at this time. Um, and so just by virtue of that is, is why Key West was that largest city. Um, the other city that kind of often vied back and forth with, with Key West for that designation was Pensacola. And so it's, it's uh, you know, no surprise that both a map of Pensacola Bay and uh, Key West would appear on the same sheet of this map from 1864 with updates to 1872, uh, because those were really the two principal uh, cities, or at least coastal cities in Florida. Uh, by this time, St. Augustine, which had been the capital of Florida since 1565, um, or shortly after, had really um, kind of fallen uh, out of the rankings. And Tallahassee, which was our capital, and still is our capital, was, was not on the water. And so its growth and, and its, its size was, was somewhat limited as well. But these coastal cities, again, particularly Pensacola, Key West, and then later Jacksonville and Tampa, uh, is where the real um, economic and population growth took place. Again, though, there were a lot of things that hampered the, that development of Key West. So in addition to <clears throat> its isolation and lack of fresh water <clears throat> was the problems that were inherent in Southern uh, port cities. And that was the spread of diseases, um, particularly yellow fever and malaria. Uh, the yellow fever epidemics swept through uh, Gulf Coast communities throughout the 1860s and 1870s. And this map, <clears throat> excuse me, from 1875 shows what they called the infected area, which is the shaded area of, of Key West during one of those large uh, yellow fever outbreaks. Um, and you, would, you can read about all kinds of, of these outbreaks in New Orleans and Mobile, Havana, Key West, uh, Galveston, and even Tampa, although Tampa was a, um, a very, very small town at, at this time. But uh, it's really interesting to have maps like this um, I guess what they would call today heat maps uh, to show the extent of an outbreak of, of a particular disease. This is a, an outstanding bird's eye view of, of Key West from 1884, really showing Key West at its, its 19th century height. Uh, again, the largest city in Florida and uh, really the economic center, if not certainly the geographic center of Florida. Um, it's really an anomaly for a city so far removed from the rest of the state to be its largest city, but that certainly was the case with Key West. Uh, it's a major shipping center, uh, again, a major center for the cigar industry, sponging, fishing, uh, wrecking wasn't quite as important anymore, um, but also an incredible amount of money spent by the federal government in the form of uh, the military bases that were there, um, but still no uh, land-based connection to the rest of Florida, to mainland Florida. The only way to get to Key West and the Florida Keys at this time was by boat. And so still limiting. And again, the lack of fresh water was also very limiting. <clears throat> of course, what they didn't know when this, this uh, bird's eye view was published in 1884 is that two years into the future, there would be a devastating fire that would sweep across uh, a portion of, of the city of Key West and do about $2 million worth of damage. And that's um, what's reflected in this Harper's page um, showing the, 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 the uh, 
the island before the fire. Uh, and it affected, in, in large part, the cigar industry. And unfortunately for Key West, just one year prior to that fire, so 1885, one of the large cigar manufacturers on the island, named Vicente Martinez Ibor, uh, went searching along the Gulf Coast for a new city to start a branch cigar factory. And he, he has a, had a, a friend who also owned a cigar factory named Ignacio Aya. And the two of them uh, weren't necessarily looking to leave Key West entirely. They just wanted to have another place to manufacture cigars. And eventually they chose Tampa. So in 1886, both Aya and Ybor opened small cigar factories in a place that became known as Ybor City here in Tampa. Shortly after that is when the fire swept through Key West. One of the buildings that was burned was Ybor's main cigar factory in Key West. So rather than rebuilding there, Ybor went ahead and built a larger factory in Key West. And it was that move. And again, those are the limitations, the, the water and the other things and its proximity to, to Cuba. It was too close to Cuba where uh, workers who were disaffected uh, could just get in a boat and that later that day they would be in Havana working at a different cigar factory. So the, what Ybor and I wanted was a place that was close enough to Havana to ship in tobacco, but far enough that the, the workers wouldn't be so inclined to leave. And so Tampa cigar industry began to really take off in the 1890s and that was in, uh, in large part to the detriment of Key West. Again, mentioning the different uh, industries that were involved throughout the Florida Keys and really South Florida, one of them was fishing. And so this is a great chart of the fishing grounds, uh, particularly they call it the, the, the snapper grounds um, off of Southwest Florida. And at this time, the shipping fleets were almost entirely coming from the Keys. Uh, there, there were some uh, fishing boats that would have gone from Boca Grande and even some coming from Tampa Bay. Uh, but most of the, the commercial fishing would have been based out of the Florida Keys at this time. And you can see quite a distance they'd have to travel uh, to go to the northernmost portions of those fishing grounds. Um, but it was a very lucrative business and very important business uh, throughout the Florida Keys and eventually throughout uh, the west coast of Florida. In mentioning the um, isolation of the Keys, it was ships like this, uh, the city of Key West, which was operated by Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast Line uh, that, can, that provided that connection, that continuous connection between, in this case, Miami, beginning in the 1890s and Key West. <clears throat> Henry Plant, who brought the railroad to Tampa and then later to Boca Grande, also operated steamships, uh, the, um, the, the Margaret and the Mascot and, and others that, uh, that took people to and from the Keys as well as shipped material between uh, Key West and Tampa. And so those connections as, as South Florida began to grow, those connections between Key West and either Miami on the East Coast or, or Tampa on the West Coast began to really solidify. But they also began to, to whittle away at Key West's dominance. So by 1890, Pensacola had taken over the top spot as uh, Florida's largest city and Key West was second. But by 1900, Key West was falling further down the rankings, I think fourth or fifth place as Tampa in particular began to rise up those rankings. Uh, and, and so you, you could see that isolation and, uh, and, and other factors were really beginning to work against Key West. Now that in the minds of the Key West boosters was gonna change uh, in 1912 when Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway uh, completed its Key West extension, carrying train traffic from Miami all the way down the Florida Keys to Key West. Uh, Flagler himself was a, a very elderly man who could hardly hear nor see at, in 1912, but he was aboard that first train that arrived in Key West in January of 1912. Uh, the idea of, of trying to connect the Keys and Key West by some kind of uh, you know, rail bridge, a rail connection, uh, were actually stretched back to the 1890s, but no one could really figure out how to do it. And honestly, why to do it? What was the economic benefit of doing so? But in 1905, uh, word came that the US government was going to uh, begin, re, re um, start work and, and hopefully finish 
uh, work on the, um, the Isthmus Canal, the Panama Canal, that would connect the Pacific uh, and Atlantic Oceans uh, through, through the Gulf of Mexico and really uh, enhance a lot of shipping traffic going into Florida's or to the U.S. East Coast, particularly into Florida. And so Flagler decided at that point that his shipping interests would benefit from a, um, a rail connection down to Key West that would then be the closest American port to what we know as the Panama Canal. Uh, the problem is it was just very difficult to run that, um, run that rail line uh, and cover a hundred, you know, hundred miles of bridges, um, particularly the seven mile bridge that crossed the uh, middle and lower keys um, and just the, the men and material that it would take to, to create the Key West extension. It took longer than anticipated. So when the Panama Canal opened in 1910, uh, the other port that was closest, again, Tampa, um, began to take a lot of that Panama Canal traffic because there was no way to get it from uh, Key West by rail. You have to just trans ship it. And so it was much easier to ship directly to a port that had rail service. And so Boca Grande, which was a smaller port um, south of uh, really much, pretty much between Tampa and Key West, um, but Tampa itself, the port of Tampa, really was the beneficiary of that <clears throat> Panama Canal trip. So by the time the uh, Key West extension opened in 1912, there wasn't the, the amount of port traffic <clears throat> that Flagler hoped to get. But what he was able to do was, was get a lot of tourist traffic. And, and that's what eventually became the salvation of Key West was the tourist industry. Uh, this map shows in a little more detail the um, the extent of the Key West extension, you can see how uh, the Flagler line stayed on the mainland as long as it could. It doesn't cross from Miami onto those keys. It goes on the mainland of Florida City and it eventually jumps um, over to Key Largo and then down, down the keys. By the 1930s, there was an effort to create an automobile highway that would run parallel to the uh, the Overseas uh, Railroad. And the federal government began to put money towards that and to put people towards that. So in the summer of 1935, there were a number of work crews, uh, particularly in the Middle Keys, were working on this new overseas highway. Uh, it was you know, very bad timing for them, um, many of them being World War I veterans, uh, because one of the worst hurricanes to, to strike the uh, mainland U.S. and certainly Florida, came through in Labor Day of 1935, uh, killing almost 400 people, including 160 who um, were lost and, and, and never found. Many of those were World War I veterans who were working for the federal government. Of course, this is also during uh, the Great Depression when there were a lot of people who were working on different federal work programs. Uh, a lot of them were in the Keys, and so um, it was just a devastating uh, hurricane and an amazing loss of life. Uh, and what contributed that to even more was a relief train was sent from Miami to the Keys to try and evacuate people. But because of the, really the lack of any kind of early warning system that you know, we enjoy today, that train was sent too late. And uh, rather than being a rescue train, it uh, actually turned out to, to contribute to the casualties that were experienced during the 1935 Labor Day hurricane. Despite those, those problems, uh, in 1938, the federal government completed what became the Overseas Highway. Uh, the Florida East Coast Railroad decided not to rebuild their rail line across the Keys. And so the federal government was able to utilize what few bridges weren't destroyed by the hurricane. Um, and they could shore up the, other, the rest of the infrastructure that was damaged and run that highway from Miami all the way to Key West. And again, much like the connection in 1912 with the railroad, the connection by automobile in 1938 really boosted the tourism industry in the Florida Keys and Key West. Uh, kind of as an indicator of that is this tourist map that was sold uh, in Key West in 1939. It was a limited edition hand colored map, uh, one of only a uh, hundred or so that they produced. Uh, there was a kind of unlimited edition version of this map that has a single color of, of kind of a reddish ink that is much more commonly available. Actually, I think Old World Auctions has one up right now. Um, but, but this map that you see here is, is much more difficult to come, come across. 
But what you do see beginning in this time and, and moving to today is an incredible number of tourist-based maps that are produced um, um, highlighting the Florida Keys and Key West. Uh, world War II, much like throughout the country and throughout the world, had a great effect on, on Key West. A lot of shipbuilding took place. Um, there was some training that took place as well. But the biggest advancement was in 1942 when there was finally a uh, pipeline, a water pipeline that connected the Florida Keys all the way down to Key West with the mainland Florida aquifer. And so you could turn on a tap anytime and fresh water would come out. And that more than anything else uh, was really what, what gave the impetus for Key West and the rest of the Keys to really grow uh, in a much more uninhibited way. Uh, and again, mostly in the realm of tourism uh, because there really weren't by this time that many jobs that weren't in the service industry. The, uh, the military was beginning to pull out of, of Key West and the Keys and uh, a lot of those jobs began to be replaced by service industry jobs. Also, by this time, Key West is becoming known as a place for artists to, uh, to, to flock to, beginning with Ernest Hemingway in 1928, um, but lots of other writers like um, Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams and others uh, made their way and lived, if not full-time, uh, lived, lived during the winter in uh, Key West. And then in the late 1940s, you had uh, President Truman making regular trips to the Keys, uh, even uh, so much so that there, the house that he stayed in on the naval base uh, became known as the Little White House uh, because he was there so often during his, his tenure as president. Uh, in addition to, to being able to uh, have a job in the service industry, uh, selling the islands themselves became an industry. So real estate was a, a, a big um, operation. And this map, you know, six maps printed on one sheet, actually there's six more prints on the other side, um, are real estate maps. And they show the township range and sections that make up the keys. And it's that township range and section model, of course, that makes selling land so much easier um, through the, you know, the, the surveying of land. And, um, and even though there's you know, more water than there is land, they still use that same system to, uh, to survey the keys for land sales. Again, mentioning tourist maps, uh, a lot of maps during the 1950s all the way up through today ended up on restaurant menus and restaurant placemats. And this one from the Flame restaurant that was uh, in Key West is one of those examples. It shows the entire length of the Keys. And so one thing I didn't mention is when um, Flagler's train made it down into Key West in 1912 and the, continued to operate, the train trip took about four and a half hours from Miami to Key West. And that's about how long it takes today to drive between Miami and Key West, and that's just because traffic is so much worse. But there was likely a time in the 50s and 60s when traffic wasn't really bad, but cars were really good, um, when you could get between Miami and Key West in probably three hours, maybe a little bit less, and you could get to the Middle Keys, um, you know, like Marathon and places like that, obviously much sooner. So having a vacation in the Middle Keys as part of your Florida vacation was, was very doable. And you could just have a day trip down into Key West. And so being able to advertise the entire uh, length of the Keys from the upper Keys close to the mainland all the way down to Key West on these, these tourist maps really demonstrates how, um, how easily it was to get around at the, at the time, which is certainly not the case today along US 1. Uh, another um, restaurant related map, the Coral Grill, which is an island Marada, again, also showing um, the length of the entire Florida Keys. And then you have the transition from commercial fishing, uh, which was represented by that commercial fishing map from the 1880s uh, to um, recreational fishing. Recreational fishing became a huge part of the tourist industry in the 1950s and 60s. And that isn't to say that it wasn't important in the 19th century, because certainly in Southwest Florida, the Fort Myers area, and then in Southeast Florida, uh, the Miami area, uh, recreational fishing for large game fish was a, a big part of the tourist industry, but really for more elite tourists. Um, but by the uh, post-war years, 1950s and 60s, you could have a, a much more you know, kind of everyday tourist come down and enjoy the fishing. It wasn't nearly as expensive and it was much easier to, to accomplish. And so you've got a lot 
of the advertising of, from, from the tourist industry directed towards recreation and fishing. Uh, this is a fun map uh, from the 1970s. And the thing I like about it is, of course, all the advertisements that ring uh, the map of Big Pine Key, which is in the lower keys. You see US 1 uh, going across the southern section of Big Pine Key. And, um, and again, showing all the different places um, you know, where you could either buy or rent a house and uh, enjoy some of the island life and then hopefully patronize some of the businesses that ring this map. Another huge industry was treasure hunting uh, at this time. And, you know, it's, this was one of those things where um, it was almost more of a, a kind of a, a scheme than anything else because it's very hard to find you know, treasure. Uh, but the idea of sunken treasure was something that you know, people could just dream about. And so there's lots of maps that were produced uh, showing alleged uh, sites for finding sunken treasure. But it's not to say that there weren't people who were actively pursuing it as their job. And one of the most famous, if not the most famous, was a man named Mel Fisher, who was a, a Key West resident for, for many, many years. Uh, he ended up finding what he was looking for after a you know, decades plus long search, which was a ship called the Atosha which was a, a treasure fleet ship that wrecked in 1622. And he um, became you know, fabulously wealthy uh, because of that. But in the, in the search for it, he had a lot of losses, both financially, but also personal, including the death of one of his sons. Um, but, uh, but his, his um, kind of legacy is still very much lasting. He passed away uh, many years ago. Um, but he still has a museum based on the island on Key West that still sells some of the items recovered from not just the Atosha, but other shipwrecks. And so he has become as much of a fixture as Key, Key West lore as, as anybody else, um, as has Jimmy Buffett. Um, you know, as much as, as someone like Mel Fisher uh, exemplifies a certain part of the Key's personality, uh, Jimmy Buffett is, is really someone who who in large part created or certainly um, amplified that personality of, of the laid back island life, a uh, place where you know, no one you know, knows who you are, no one cares to know who you are. Um, you could escape you know, any past sins and, and no one will worry about any of the current sins that you're, you're committing. Um, Buffett arrived in Key West in 1972, um, already a somewhat established musician. He, he wasn't, wasn't new to the business. Um, he was a, um, a, a folk singer based largely out of Nashville, but uh, he came, he moved to Key West in 1972 and lived there to some degree or another, really for the next 30 plus years, um, but really lived there full time for about 10 years into the early 1980s until he became you know, very, very wealthy and eventually I think moved to, to Palm Beach and has houses all over the place now. But it's it's really Jimmy Buffett more than anybody else who's created this mystique of what um, what life is like on the island. This in large part due to his observational uh, method of, of songwriting. When you listen to albums from his time in the Keys, there were I think six or seven different, what they call the Key West albums. Uh, this one, Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes, this is fifth. And then I chose it because it has the compass rose on it. Uh, uh, he wrote about the people and the places in the Keys and Key West. And so really, you could really feel like you're there in the Keys as you're listening to his music. Another thing that became to really exemplify Key West was this idea of the concrete public. And the mayor of Key West actually uh, tried to secede the city of Key West from the rest of the country in the 1980s. And this was in reaction to the federal government's efforts to stop drug running, which had become rampant in the Florida Keys of Key West in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, just like blockade runners during the Civil War, uh, the, the string of islands provided incredible cover and endless places to smuggle in drugs from the rest of the Caribbean. And so as a way to stop that and the flow of illegal immigrants into the mainland of Florida, the US Border Patrol basically set up a blockade and in the upper keys and you had to show identification to go through as if you're going across a foreign border to get in the, into the keys. And so because of that, the mayor of Key West said, if you're gonna treat us like a foreign country, we're going to be a foreign country. 
and officially unofficially seceded from the union. Um, that of course wasn't legal action, but it doesn't stop people even to this day from selling passports and things like that, uh, that relate to the conquered public. And you, know, you all might recognize this map as a take on the New Yorker's uh, famous cover view of the world from Ninth Avenue, which dates from the same time. Period. And this is the last uh, slide I have for, the, for, the, for my talk. And again, ending on that, that shipwreck idea, the, the tourism idea that people have of, of the Keys. Um, the Keys now are really overrun. It's probably not too strong a word um, with tourists. There are cruise ships that uh, use Key West as a port of call. The, uh, the middle and upper Keys have less of that tourism pressure, but they still have a tremendous amount of it, um, particularly through the recreational fishing and other things like that. But um, the people of Key West actually attempted through local referendum to limit the number and amount of cruise ships that dock there. But uh, our state legislature, in its wisdom, has decided that uh, people in Tallahassee know more about uh, what's going on in the local municipality than the local people. And so they have created preemption laws um, to block what local municipalities can do to govern their own places. And then one of those preemption laws forced to try to put off those limitations that the people of Key West wanted to put on the cruise industry. And so uh, places like Key West have become um, almost unaffordable for most people. Uh, it's still very heavily weighted towards service industry jobs there, but those who work in service industries can't afford to live on the island. So some live an hour or even two hours away uh, on other islands. Some of the larger employers were actually um, bring in those workers by bus. Um, others have purchased apartment buildings either on Key West or on Stock Island, which is uh, just to the eastern side of Key West or, or other islands, uh, to have places for their employees to live um, because it's just simply too expensive. Uh, a small, uh, what they call a shotgun style house or, you know, small wood frame house that in the 1960s would have cost, you know, three or $4,000 which the equivalent today would be, you know, maybe fifteen or twenty thousand uh, dollars, now could sell for a million. Um, it, it has really become um, unaffordable in, in kind of almost every sense of the word. Um, but it's still very much attractive, and it's still something that draws people uh, on a daily basis uh, to all kind of find their little piece of Margaritaville uh, and watch that sunset at Mallory Square. And so, uh, if you haven't been to Key West, Despite its busyness, I would encourage you, you to, to, to go there, or at least one of the other keys, um, because it really is a, a beautiful place. Uh, and with that, I thank you all for, for listening to my talk, and I am happy to answer any questions that you all may have. And if you'd like to see these maps or any others, please visit the Touch the Map Library online. Um, and you can really just Google Touch the Map Library um, or Tampa Bay History Center, and you can find the map library that way if you don't have the opportunity to write down that you are around. So again, thank you all so much. Hope you enjoyed this. And please, if you have any questions, I see there's a couple on the chat, but I don't know if there are questions. Hey, Rodney, thanks very much. Um, very interesting um, telling of the historical geography of the Keys for what, 500 years? And then using 500 years of maps to show that. That's uh, quite interesting. Um, I did see one. I saw a couple questions. Let me. Um, yep, I'm, I'm looking at one now. Can you uh, see Roberta Stevens? Yeah. I'm sorry? Do you see Roberta Stevens' question? Yes, yes. Any plans underway to deal with the rise of sea level? Will the keys disappear? Um, yeah, they probably will. Uh, so, yeah, as we know, the, the world has experienced uh, over millennia, rise and fall in sea level. At different times, Florida has been about twice as wide as it is today, and Florida has been completely underwater. Um, and so we are seeing sea levels rise today. You can attribute it to what people have done, or it's natural, whatever it is. The reality is sea levels are rising. And one of the biggest issues, other than that, things just being totally underwater, is what they call sunny day flooding. And that's you know where, without you know any rain, you're starting to see water kind of back up through the the storm sewers or storm drains and come onto uh, 
uh, the land into the streets. So it's happening, actually, um, it's happening here in Tampa. Um, I just, as I was driving home last week, I was, noticed it on this road called Bayshore. It's happening in Miami Beach in Miami. Um, and it's happening in the Keys. Um, you know, a place that is on a bay, a city on a bay, um, though extraordinarily expensive, uh, you can create some kind of lock system or dam or dike or something to to keep the water out of the bay from the larger bodies of water. But with Key West being totally surrounded by water and the rest of the Keys, short of, of literally raising the, the level of the land, I don't know what they could do to combat the rise of sea levels. So, uh, you know, presumably not in our lifetime or you know, who knows how many lifetimes away, but at some point with the rise of sea levels, um, certainly some of the smaller keys, lower keys will be underwater sooner, but in theory, Key West, which I think at its highest is maybe 15 to 20 feet above sea level, um, certainly parts of it could be underwater within the next 100 years, 150 years. It's pretty frightening. Think about it. Uh, any other questions? Doesn't don't uh, see any. Um, stop sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, if if you all don't have any, oh, one one new message. Uh, five o'clock somewhere exactly. It's uh, eight o'clock here, and almost one o'clock I guess for uh, Philip. Um, but yeah, I uh, hope some of some of you had. Nice cold drink in your hand as you're listening to this presentation. Hey, Rodney, how long is your exhibit on display? So the show runs through October 15th here at the, uh, the History Center. And so if you happen to make your way to Tampa uh, between now and then, you know, more than happy to show you this exhibit. If you don't, you know, we, we change exhibits here now once a year. Uh, we're starting to do it twice a year. Uh, but our next show is going to be on the history of the 1920s land boom. Uh, we have lots and lots of 1920s era maps that show the growth of Florida. And so um, we're, we're doing that and we're gonna have a companion uh, temporary exhibit in our larger uh, exhibit gallery on the 1920s in general in Florida. So uh, we'll have a map show here and a 1920s exhibit in our, our, our large temporary exhibit gallery. Uh, hey, now you indicated the map images are on your website. Is the exhibit, yes. is there a virtual exhibit? So uh, there will be. We have a partnership with the University of South Florida where they will come in and, and digitize our galleries. And we have done that with all of our previous map shows. They've not done the Key West exhibit yet, but they will. And um, I believe that is housed in a different part of our website, which is tampabayhistorycenter.org. Uh, but, um, but yeah, we do want to be able to do um, a vir virtual tour of all of our exhibits. Um, we, we don't turn them into online exhibits, which I guess we have them all digitized, so we could do that, but we have yet to do so. Um, any other questions? Uh, <laughs> uh, any chance for Florida Map Society in the future or restarting the Miami Map Fair? Um, so, yeah, we've talked more about a, a Florida Map Society than, than the, the second question. Um, I think it would be something we'd like to do here. Uh, there are a lot of map collectors in, in Florida. Uh, Florida's a big state, but you know, so are a lot of the other states that have map societies. Um, so we'd like to do that. Now, as far as the Miami Map Fair, um, it's my understanding that Miami, History of Miami is, I know they're not gonna do a map fair uh, for 2024. <clears throat> um, and so I don't know their future after that for 2025. I would, to be honest with you, I would like for us to host a map fair here in Tampa, but the logistics of that are very frightening uh, to me uh, and to Tom and to others. So I, I don't quite know how we would do it. I don't know, I don't know a lot of those, those factors, but I would really like to try. And so one of the things that I have on my, my to-do list for 2024 is to uh, talk to a lot of folks who are involved in the Miami fair and, and really, see if it's practical to have a Tampa fair. It would just necessarily be smaller than Miami. Um, we don't have the same direct international flights that uh, Miami has or even Orlando has. Um, our facility is smaller than history of Miami. Um, so there are a lot of limitations that we have, but I would, I would love to, to kind of give it a go. 
Um, it can provide a link again for the maps. I will put, I'll share my screen again and show that last slide. Um, um, again, I'll go up and down. And so, but again, if you just look up uh, tampabayhistorycenter.org and then slash a lot of different things, um, or if you just go to our website, you can find the map library that way. Or like I said, you now, because we've had so many people searching for the, for the map library, you can literally just Google Touchton Map Library and it comes right up. And then from there, you'll see a, um, a link to our, um, our map collection. Uh, we use Luna uh, like a few other uh, map libraries, um, but we are actually gonna be migrating probably to a different software or a different host uh, in the next year or so, but <clears throat> everything will be available. We have um, uh, about 5,000 maps available on, online through the website. And even though it's a Florida collection, uh, we do have a lot of maps of the Caribbean and a lot of maps of the Southeastern US just because of Florida's position as this gateway between those two spaces. So, um, so you might find maps that aren't, they, they have Florida on them, but they're not necessarily Florida maps. We actually were able to do a show several years ago uh, purely on the history of, of uh, Cuban maps. And when I talked to Tom about doing that show, he said, well, I don't have a lot of Cuban maps. I have Florida maps. I said, I said well, if you look at your maps, particularly the older ones, they're actually maps of Cuba that happen to have Florida on. And so we have a lot of, of, of uh, West Indian uh, Caribbean maps and again, a lot of maps of the Southeastern US. Uh, okay, one more question. You mentioned wreckage was big industry, assuming ship repair. So, um, there was shipbuilding and ship repair, but it was difficult to get materials to Key West. And so it was really more of a port. And the wrecking industry wasn't so much about recovering a ship to repair it. It was recovering a ship to get the stuff on board and sell it. Um, so while there was a, 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 a um, small amount of, um, of ship works in Key West, the, the main, the main ports in Florida for ship construction, ship repair were Jacksonville, um, Pensacola, and, uh, and Tampa. Any other questions? <laughs> You're welcome. If there are none, I again wanna thank you all so very much uh, for having me uh, speak to your combined map societies. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of the presentations that are in the future myself. Okay, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Washington Map Society and the other societies. We have a few little gifts for you. Um, first of all, I've been giving people a set of cards, uh, art cards that show a particular city. In this case, it's Washington, D.C., to remind you that you spoke to the Washington Map Society. But the other one is a cut line map, and it's of Tampa. Oh, so I'll be sending those to you. Oh, thank and, you. That's very kind. And what, one correction on my announcements. I said the next meeting was September 14. It's actually September 12. But you'll see a lot of other publicity before then. So you don't always have to listen to what I say. I do want to say one more thing. As you look at our website and see maps, you cannot download them from our website. But if you see anything that you want to use, just contact me and I can get you a high resolution image. We, there, we have them as high resolution maps. We just don't offer them for immediate download. Um, but please, if, you, if there's anything you all ever need as it relates to our collection, just let me know and, uh, and I'll happy to go for you. Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, we can leave the chat room open for a few minutes if people wanna just chat with each other, or we can 